The reality of a backstory is always quite profound. I was with some friends the other day eating a freshly baked scone with some fresh cream and some fig jam. And as I was eating it, I realised that that fig jam had a backstory. Some months ago, my wife and her friend went out into an abandoned orchard and picked buckets loads of figs. And they carried those figs in and got shy approval to make jam in their kitchens. And so down at the local Progress Association Sunday stall, there's always free scones, fig jam and cream. And so that fig jam, while everybody was enjoying a free scone and a hot cuppa, didn't realise that there is a backstory to that fig jam. And I want to talk about the idea of the backstory because most of the time we don't care about the backstory. The, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. We enjoy it and we don't worry where it comes from. But sometimes the backstory is very, very important. And sometimes I want to talk about the Bible when we can look at biblical narrative, read of a story or of an incident, and being unaware of the people and the politics and the ethnicity and the culture of those distant events, we can draw wrong conclusions and we can understand Scripture erroneously. I want to show you today because a superficial reading of Scripture can be very, very dangerous if we don't read it with understanding and context and depth of the times in which they occurred. A well-known atheist lambasted the Christian faith and the Bible because he made an assertion where he, in his reading of the Bible, he said the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Wow! So you can read the scriptures and look at the God of the Old Testament and say, ha, what a bully, with all the explosives thrown in. So, how did he arrive at that con conclusion? Well, you can easily arrive at that conclusion, for example, in Noah's day. God allegedly created humans in his image and likeness and then becomes unhappy with them and drowns all of humanity except for one family. What sort of a God is that? Sodom and Gomorrah become very violent and wicked, and God's unhappy, so he sends fire and brimstone and destroys them. And then we read the story of the children of Israel, Abraham's descendants heading out of slavery into the promised land, and eventually God tells them to go out and wipe out certain nations and occupy their land. Colonialism at the worst scale to dispossess the inhabitants of Canaan. And so, an atheist's appraisal of God may seem apropos at that particular point. So, without context, without historical understanding of the times in which people live without the full picture, we probably can come up with a reasonable assertion and say, well, this is my reading of it, and that's the best that I can do, etc. However, we need to dig a little bit deeper and get in on the backstory, the historical, cultural, ethnic, e ethnic context of all those distant events and realise that without some of those details, we can draw wrong conclusions and be terribly wrong. In other words, you could easily say that God is a bully and a nasty piece of work. I don't see God. I see God as merciful, loving, kind, generous, forgiving. So how could somebody draw the exact opposite conclusion. It's a good question and one I think we need exploring. And we're going to explore that through an, what I would say, a curious incident in Scripture that can lead to ambiguity. Now, if you go back in history, and it's not my point to point out all the egregious things in, in, in history, but Noah's days were particularly violent. Blood was being shed on this earth and the, there was only one righteous man. And so God reset his, pro, his, his plan. God had a purpose. He had a plan. And when you... There is a point of going beyond redemption. The Bible makes that clear. And there's nothing worse than when bloodthirsty, rapist, murderous ethos in society prevails constantly from generation to generation... How do you deal with it? How do you bring healing and order out of chaos? Sometimes you have to reset the button. 
What about in Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, the, the ancient Israelites, the, the peoples that God told to dispossess in Canaan, had one of their practices was to burn their children on the altar of the god of Moloch, a big stone god that they had. And many, many children were sacrificed on this altar. Now, you and I would think this is absolutely abhorrent. What a horrible society that was. But can I remind us, we house sacrifice our children even before they are born on the altar of abortion. And we have done it on a greater scale than those ancients. ancients. So what sort of judgment might be hanging over us for the egregious sins that we've legislated into law? If you study Sodom and Gomorrah, they had legislated wickedness into law. And so that gives us a little bit of a backstory, a little bit of a, a framework to try to understand some of the biblical narrative. When you see murder, rape, torture, wickedness and malevolence on a grand scale, redress has to come from somewhere. Because you and I have a, a sense of right and wrong, a morality that transcends our physical existence. Anyway, I was really shocked this week. I follow quite a few archaeological reviews and the worst kind of discovery that they're still making in Argentina, in the Peruvian Alps and in the Andes are the frozen remains of bound and gagged 14-year-old girls up on a mountaintop as a sacrifice to some deity. And today we find those young women in their crouched bodily position um, and scientists study them for their DNA and everything else and we ponder how degraded a society can become. I look forward to the day of resurrection, of justice and judgment, when those young women that were sacrificed in a horrific, brutal society in order to please the gods, so to speak, will be resurrected to justice and to live and to know that there is a God of mercy and kindness and truth. I think for our generation, we've just been 70 odd years from World War II, living in peace and prosperity and plenty. It's very hard for us to imagine a whole society descending into the order of what Uganda experienced some 20, 25 years ago when there was machetes in every town and blood everywhere. Go back in history and read some of the events that happened in Uganda and as a parallel to how wickedness can spread right throughout a society. Um, I suppose if I hadn't travelled overseas, just lived here in Australia, we largely live by the rule of law here, but I've seen egregious suffering and I've seen where, you know, here at least we trust the rule of law and the integrity of the police. But when you see police taking bribes, you realise the dysfunctionality of an entire society where it's dog eat dog and lots of blood is shed. Anyway, what I want to do today is take a puzzling piece of scripture and give it some context. And so that we are no longer erroneously reading scripture. You know, people say that you know, the God of the Old Testament was a nasty piece of work, but the Jesus of the New Testament was kind and gentle, working for social justice and doing charitable work. He was a good man, and yet religion crucified him. But can I tell you, a serious student of the Bible, scholars know that the Jesus of the New Testament was the Lord and the voice in the Old Testament. And that Jesus revealed the Father. Sometimes we go in Genesis, we say, we hear God says, let us make man in our image and like our likeness. So the God of the Old Testament speaks in unison, in a plurality. In Isaiah, the Lord says, who will go for us? And Jesus is the word of God, the spokesperson who revealed himself, who came in the flesh. So how do you reconcile the God of the Old Testament and the Jesus manifest in the New Testament? Well, in the New Testament, there is a gospel narrative that has a curious incident that begs an explanation. It was Passover season. Jesus knew that the time for his death, his suffering, his crucifixion had come, and he made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was a Passover season, the first of three pilgrimage seasons, and Jerusalem was alive and abuzz from people near and far come to celebrate at that pilgrimage festival. And so, um, against this background... I haven't put the details here in chronological order, but there was a curious incident. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. 
On the following day when they came from Bethany, Jesus had been into Jerusalem. He rode a donkey into Jerusalem. He turned over the money chambers tables. He went back out to Bethany. And, and when he went to Bethany, seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Let's go down to verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And at that point you think, wow, what's the backstory to this? Anyway, let me finish Jesus' answer on this, because Jesus' answer seems like obfuscation or not an honest answer to the issue of the fig tree. But listen carefully. And Jesus said to, answered him, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Elsewhere Jesus says, If my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So Jesus now says, I've just cursed this fig tree and it's died. But you can say, if you have faith, to throw a mountain into the sea and it'll be done. Continue in verse 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. What kind of faith do you have? We'll explore that. Verse 25. And then Jesus concludes with something else. And whenever you stand praying, if you come before God and you're asking a particular request, forgive, because if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is also in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Now we're still not any clearer, are we, to the act of cursing a fig tree? And now we know that Jesus was on the, getting close to his crucifixion. Enormous pressure was on him for the purpose in which he willingly laid down his life. And you know, and he probably saw with his disciples the rigours of Roman crucifixion. It was a common occurrence in the first century. The Romans had perfected human torture in that sense to where it was the most brutalist suffering that anybody could ever experience. So was Jesus out of his depth and a little bit of irrationality creeping in? Well, hardly. Because he was hungry, was he also a little bit irrational? and having a little bit of a, a bad mood and a bit of an anger fit. Well, hardly. That doesn't fit into the character of Christ either, does it? So let's look back a little bit deeper. Because Jesus' answer isn't all that clear as to why he cursed the fig tree. He talks about the power behind his cursing, available to you and me. If we are forgiven by our Father and Christ is in us, that we indeed have the authority and the blessing of Jesus to move mountains and throw them into the sea. That kind of power, as he illustrated to those disciples those days. I believe there is a deeper metaphoric insight into Jesus cursing that fig tree that day. Because Matthew records the same event. And then Luke, the beloved physician, also records a parable that Jesus told about a fig tree. We'll read that in a moment. Um, and that was just giving the fig tree more time. A merciful, gracious God giving an unfruitful tree more time to bear fruit. Now, let's go back in history a little bit. And we've got a couple of examples from Hosea, Micah, and Jeremiah of the historical significance or the metaphor of a fig tree. And when Jesus cursed the fig tree, the fig tree from antiquity, from the scriptures, would have come to mind in those first century disciples. Let's go to Hosea. Hosea, he was a prophet of God to ancient Israel, a rebellious ancient Israel who had sunk down in the mire of deceit and lies and sexual fornication and, and, and pagan gods. So Hosea echoes God's heart when he says, Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its season, I saw your fathers. So he likens the faithful in the past as the first fruits on a fig tree. And the idea of first fruits in the line of Abraham is that God is starting small, first fruits, the early harvest, to one day have the greater harvest of all of humanity. But then Hosea says, but they came to Baal Peor. Instead of coming to God, they go to a pagan god, Baal, and consecrated themselves to the thing of shame and became detestable like the thing they loved. 
And that was God's criticism through the words of Micah of his fig tree. See, in other words, ancient Israel looked like a successful nation. God had planted them and nurtured them and watered them and, and led them and produced them. But the fruit wasn't there. The good fruit wasn't there. In other words, Israel looked all leafy and green and vibrant and alive and despite its blessings, either produced no fruit or rotten fruit. And that's the travesty, that's the metaphor that Jesus was acting out. However, in Luke's parable on the fig tree, it shows another aspect to this God inspecting his tree. Listen to this, it shows a God of mercy, a God of patience, a God of deferring judgment. Luke chapter 13, verse 6, and Jesus told this parable, a story. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, the person who cared for it, Look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And that's any agricultural's prerogative. You plant a garden, you plant a tree, when a given time frame it doesn't bear fruit, it's fruitless, it's useless. But the vine dresser answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now this adds to the story. The fig tree is a metaphor for bearing fruit and upon inspection, good fruit or no fruit or bad fruit. Now, back to Jerusalem, first century, a particularly vibrant celebratory time as thousands of people from near and far came to this first pilgrimage festival and Jesus inspects the tree. And what does he see? He's immediately disappointed. He sees all leaves, no fruit. All expectation, no satisfaction. <coughs> so, can you see that Jesus cursing the fruit tree, the fig tree, is a lived-out metaphor? Not just spoken, but lived out. Because fruitlessness leads to judgment, and Jesus is the righteous judge. So, what's the story here? <coughs> Jerusalem is a city of peace. Yaru Shalom in Hebrew. City of peace. But it's been anything but that. It's been a city of bloodshed, of war, of conquest. And the city at the time of Jesus was rotten to the core because the religious leaders of the day were plotting Jesus' murder. That's what they were doing. And it was rife. You see, the ancient Israelites were supposed to be God's chosen people. They were supposed to, to reflect to the world around them order, law, righteousness, humility, service, grace, faithfulness. But they didn't, and they failed egregiously. And so the metaphor of the figs that the master of the field is so hopeful for is very powerful. It's very sad as well. If you go to Micah chapter 7, 1, Micah says, Woe is me. He reflects God's heart in this. For I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. So God comes and looks at the tree that he's planted, and he's very, very disappointed. Jeremiah, another prophet of God, was called to ministry when he was 17. And somewhere in his ministry, chapter 8, verse 13, the Lord says, When I should gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed away from them. So God gave to the ancient Israelites protection, providence, abundance, everything they could ever do, protection from their enemies, health, and they gave it all away. And when God came inspecting his project, he was mightily disappointed. And so when G Jesus cursed the fig tree, those disciples around him would have remembered the words of the prophets again and again, comparing Israel to something that was leafy green but with no good fruit. Let's continue. Jesus knew that his hour had come. 
He, he came to willingly give his life as a sin sacrifice that you and I can live. He said, no one takes my life. I lay it down willingly. And it was a climatic time. So the disciples heard Jesus distinctly curse the fig tree and they were familiar with the writings of the prophets of old. And they understood what Jesus was doing and saying because it turned on a light in their minds. When you go to synagogue and hear the law of Moses, the Psalms, the Proverbs and the prophets read to you every Sabbath, you remember it. And the power association would have been very clear. You know, just prior to cursing the fig tree, Jesus rode a donkey or a colt of a donkey into Jerusalem as the new king, establishing his kingdom. And the allusion to this comes out of Zechariah chapter 9. So when, G when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they cried, Hosanna, son of David, people laid out palm branches and they laid out their coats for this new king to enter Jerusalem at that Passover time. We go back to Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In fact, if you read Matthew, Matthew records exact quotations and illusions from the prophets over 60 times. In fact, direct quotes and illusions almost a hundred times from the Old Testament. Very powerful, very interesting because um, the narrative of the fig tree plays a bigger story as the Lord Jesus Christ, through spoken metaphor and acted metaphor, speaks into the people of his day. So what sort of fruit was Jesus looking for in that city of Jerusalem as enacted with that fig tree with no fruit? Well, Apostle Paul, a follower of Jesus Christ, describes it in Galatians 5.22. He says, The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control. These were the virtues that the Lord Jesus was looking into the city of peace and he didn't find. God wants us to produce good fruits. And so when he comes looking, he sees the fruits that we would produce. So Jerusalem at that time, in other words, was all leafy green. There was lots of activity, lots of festivities, lots of people from near and far. And despite the green foliage, there was no good fruit. Do you see the analogy? It's very powerful. Very powerful. So Jesus came into Jerusalem at that time as the new king, riding on a donkey. And the people cried out, Save us, O son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. There was no ambiguity about who Jesus was and what his purpose and mission was and how he, at that right prior to his passion, makes himself known on a level never previously enacted. He came in on a donkey, enacting a metaphor, a prophecy from well past. What does he do after he comes in on a donkey? He goes to the temple. And what does Jesus do? He makes a whip of cords and he creates chaos in the temple. He drives out the money changers and the animals and their tables and their coins. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. In other words, the very centre of worship should be a place of sanctity, holiness and prayer, but it was full of extortion and robbery. Does it paint the fig cursing of the fig tree in a little greater clarity as what Jesus was looking for and the, the pain and the anguish and the disappointment of what he actually found? All right, let's move on. It's okay to talk about things of the prophets three and a half thousand years ago. It's okay to talk about Jesus and the events of the first century 2,000 years ago. I want us to think about our figs, the things that we produce in our lives. What fruit do you bear? What fruit do I bear, good or bad? You know, in heaven's balances, only good fruit is worthy of commendation. Bad fruit is judged and condemned. No fruit, according to some of Jesus' parables, also judged and condemned, just like bad fruit. So the fig tree that Jesus cursed isn't just about Jesus being hungry. It's not just about 
a metaphor pointing to ancient Israel. It's a message to all who would be followers of Jesus Christ and want to live authentically and transparently before their Lord and Saviour, Jesus. It's about us. In other words, it's not good enough just to look good on the outside. And that's the message for today when Jesus comes and inspects his metaphoric tree. See, we can appear happy, erudite, well-educated, intellectually bright, good use of English, good deportment, emotionally affable. And on the outside, we can fool people. But God's not fooled. God knows what's on the inside. He knows every hair on our head. And he wants to see love, joy, peace, kindness and gentleness, forgiveness and mercy, faith. That's the fruit that Jesus is looking for. Good fruit. And the transformation in Christ is radical. Maybe we were a barren tree at one stage. But with the manure and the, and the tending of the vine dresser, may we begin to bear good fruit, powerfully and abundant in our lives. What sort of fruit? Truth and righteousness. Faith and obedience. And total surrender to Jesus. That's what the Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, is looking for. Just a point on, on looking good on the outside and being corrupt on the inside. That's the danger of religion or being religious. See, the religious leaders of the day wore great long robes. They had special ribbons or phylacteries on the end of their robes. They washed their hands multiple times a day. They did all the kind of rituals. And for the common person on the street, it put the religiosity at such a high level. But Jesus knew it was all a show and all a sham. He said to those religious leaders that angered them at about the time, Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, they were the religious leaders of the day, you hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. What a stinging comment to the religious leaders of the day. In verse 27, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, great monuments that gleam in the beautiful sunlight, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Jesus saw straight through the facade into the hearts of those religious men fermenting murder. So, brothers and sisters, not only do we need a strong root brace as a tree with roots deep in the soil of the word God, God's word, like the psalmist says, a tree that's planted by still waters bearing fruit in its season, not only are we to be leafy green, but we're also to bear fruits, abundant fruits, so the Lord of the harvest can come and see the investment that he's made. You know, Jesus shows us then, in his answer to Peter and those disciples within earshot, he says then about what he did, number one, have faith in God. That you can say, if you are bearing the fruits of the Holy Spirit and you are found whole and godly in his sight, and you are in Christ, that you can say to that mountain, be moved, and by faith it will be moved. Because the words of Christ, the fruit of God, is good fruits are being produced in you. You will live nothing less than a powerful faith and empowered life and bear those extraordinary fruits even greater than what Jesus did. Mountain be thrown into the sea, and it's done. And you know what that means? If you bear good fruit and you are found to be in Christ, a healthy tree, the possibilities are limitless, endless, because Jesus is Lord. And for men, things are impossible. But Jesus reminds us that for God, all things are possible. Then Jesus concludes, if you're going to have this kind of power, you must be right with God. When you pray, Forgive others, even as your Father has forgiven you. That right relationship. So the lesson for today, the fig tree, and we've talked a lot of today, the lesson of today, just don't look good on the outside. Make sure the inside is pure and holy and bearing good fruits. So what will the Lord find on close inspection? Will he find only leaves or will he find figs as well? It's an interesting question. So next Sunday when I go down to the fire shed and enjoy a scone and cream and fresh fig jam, I'm reminded that there's always a backstory giving clarity and context. 
In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm your brother, John Classic. <laughs>